Good morning and welcome to Dublin City FM on this beautiful east wall morning with the sun shining out there and the uh, seagulls floating down the Tolka like only they can. And today we've got a, uh, a very special edition for you. Um, we've got one city, one book. It's one of the great uh, innovations of uh, Dublin City Council or more specifically Dublin City Library. Last week they announced that the... Um, the author, the uh, book, uh, One City, One Book for 2017 was going to be Echo Land, uh, and it's been uh, authored by Joe Joyce, and I'm delighted to say that uh, Joe is in the studio with us the, uh, today. So, good morning, Joe, and welcome to Council Matters. Good morning, Mick, and yeah. thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come yeah. and talk to you. Yeah. Joe, um, in many ways, you know, we're the equivalent of what I would call bake-off, except uh, you and I, we use data or words, information, whatever you like, to, uh, to knead all of this into a, um, uh, a delicious concoction. We start off at the very beginning. You were a journalist, uh, a print journalist, if I got it correctly. I was indeed, yeah, for, for most of my career, uh, mainly, mainly working with the Irish Times mm -hmm. a very long time ago and then freelancing for them and for a variety of other papers, mainly foreign papers. And sure. Things, yeah. Am I right in thinking you would have begun that about late 60s, early 70s? Early 70s, thereabouts, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're not from Dublin? I'm not, no, I'm a genuine culture. Ah, it's a <laughs> particular honour, actually, to be... Uh, <laughs> Chosen for the one city, one book to have a culture doing it. I mean, this is a show we, you know, we absorb, you know, we're, we're integrationists here, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, just as long as, just so long as you don't marry the daughter. <laughs> but I'm interested in asking you this because you and I, we probably did our leave insert and the usual spiel after that around the same time. Now, Getting into journalism in those days, from my perspective, and I came from the north inner city, it wasn't really, it might have been the sort of thing you fancy doing, but generally speaking, uh, you knew really you weren't going to get it because you weren't middle class enough. What was your uh, uh, view on that? Did you, uh, we always thought you had to have a connection, a family connection, which wasn't entirely uh, uh, false. What was uh, your intro to uh, well, you're right. You're right. It was a totally different uh, system back in those days. I mean, the traditional system to get into, um, a, a, say, a national newspaper at the time was uh, to work in a provincial paper for a couple of mm -hmm. years. Uh, but I was I was lucky, and uh, journalism is a very very haphazard business, uh, mm -hmm. really. And I was lucky in the sense that um, when I came along to it. Um, it was a period when they were deciding to uh, hire graduates rather than people from provincial okay. papers. And I had been um, a student in uh, UCG in Galway okay. and editing the student newspaper. No, it was and a good start, it, isn't it? It was a good start. Yeah. Uh, start as you mean to go on. And um, I was contacted by the Irish Times in my last year there while I was editor because they, want, they had a, a, a feature at the time mm. of from the universities and they wanted someone to do UCG. Yep. Okay. And uh, so that gave me contacts in the Irish Times and then when I graduated I talked to them and they said oh come and talk to so and so and um, yep. Dare I say it, was that the time when uh, UCD's or uh, UCG's uh, student union was lorded, o lorded over by one Pat Rabbit? It was actually even before that. <laughs> uh, it was earlier than that, a couple of years. Yeah, uh, yeah it, been, it would have been a couple of years before uh, Pat became the mm -hmm. main man there. Yeah, because it's interesting. Uh, in those days, uh, there was only... Uh, Correct me on this one. Uh, there was only one place in uh, in Ireland you could actually do a journalism course, and that was the College of Commerce in Rathmines. And there was one guy who in our class who uh, went to that, and he just happened to be Ray McNally's son, <laughs> who right. was the bro the elder brother of Angus. Uh, and that to me was uh, how you got into journalism. You had a family connection or something or other, you know. Um, uh, and it doesn't seem to have changed an awful lot. Well, I don't think it's an entirely fair. I mean, I know yeah. uh, a couple of my contemporaries in the Irish Times uh, did get in through uh, the College of Commerce, which, as you rightly okay. say, was the only it was, was the only, was the the only yes, uh, dedicated academic uh, yeah. route into it. And uh, neither of them, uh, one of whom was uh, a good friend and former editor of the Irish Times, Geraldine Kennedy, uh -huh. who had absolutely no connections. Yeah, well, Insurance. some people got through on uh, ability, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is always good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people who uh, I went to uh, uh, UCD with, uh, who are still there, for argument's sake, uh, Kevin Myers. Uh, oh, the I thought you were going to say they were still in UCD. But no, no, yeah. no I, I, I'm not convinced Kevin actually left UCD. He just got paid better. Uh, and Paddy Woodworth uh, was, uh, you know, so... Uh, but these were very middle-class people compared to where I grew up. Um, and, 
Uh, even now, I still don't know that many people who grew up, dare I say it, in working class areas of Dublin who have uh, um, managed to break that uh, ceiling. Yeah, that's that's possibly true. I don't, I, 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 couldn't tell you whether it is or it isn't true. Yeah. To be honest, because I'm not involved in uh, uh, in journalism and haven't yeah. been for some time on yeah. a day to day basis. So yeah, yeah. So let's have a look. If I have a look at your opus, now there's a good word, isn't it? Oh, lovely four letter word. Yes. <laughs> if I have a look at your, uh, particularly your known uh, uh, journalist opus and your, uh, um, although. Th 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 there's always crossover. I mean, it's of never. Of course, there is. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've written uh, novels. You've written plays. You've also written biographies, and two of which stand out. Um, probably because there's only two. <laughs> uh, one on the Guinnesses. Um, mm. I mean, what did you? Uh, what, how did you come away from that? Did you think, oh, what a great Irish family that we should all be proud of, and uh, uh, or do you think this is a bunch of drug dealers who did quite well for themselves? Well, you can look at it both ways, yeah. you know. Uh, I, I, I think you, you, yes, you can, you can look at it either way. But I, I think it's, it's a very, very interesting story of how mm -hmm. a family uh, basically reinvented itself back at the very beginning, uh, okay. and pretending to be somebody they, they actually weren't at the very beginning, yeah. and how. But they brewers themselves, or did they just know people who were? Uh, were well, they smart operators? One they? of the intriguing things about the first Arthur Guinness is that nobody really knows where the family came from. Okay. Uh, they claim to be uh, from the McGuinnesses of uh, County Down, who yeah. were sort of uh, traditional Irish chieftains. Yeah. But uh, some DNA research by one of their descendants, yeah. um, uh, another friend of mine, Patrick Guinness, uh, has uh, shown that they probably came from that area, mm -hmm. but they weren't McGuinnesses. Okay. Uh, they were part of, probably part of the clan, but they weren't the, yeah. the, the clan leaders. Yeah. But they, very interestingly, the first Arthur Guinness basically buried his uh, antecedents. Okay. And uh, back in the late 19th century, some of his, uh, the first Lord Ivy, spent enormous amounts of money uh, trying to discover where the family had come from okay. and never succeeded. Yeah. Yeah, though I'm interested because, you see, I live beside St Anne's and uh, St Anne's yeah. was a, uh, a, I think it was a, of the Plunkets, was it? Um, uh, well, uh, it was Lord Ivy's brother, Lord Ardalon, who, uh, Lord Ardalon, who, yes, who, who yes, built yes. it and it, uh, yeah, he had no children and it went to the Plunkets when he yeah, died, yeah. who oh. were his sisters mm -hmm. and sons. Yeah, it was something in its day. That's, oh, it's still absolutely, something, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. It, without uh, dwelling on this, where did the recipe come from? Because Guinness, I'm sure, they, the marketers would love you to believe that we still make it the same way now that we do. Oh, well, this is another. This is another of the wonderful myths about Guinness. You know yeah. that it has to be made on Liffey water and that it came from a special recipe. Yeah. I mean, uh, stout was actually invented, in, if invented as the word, or devised in London uh, long before the Guinness had started mm. brewing it. And indeed, when Arthur Guinness started brewing first, he didn't start brewing stout. He brewed beer in general. Okay. And it was only, I think, nearly 40 years after he started that he concentrated only on stout. Yeah, yeah. They, they seem to be a classic example of, of uh, if you get a good monopoly, you can really do, uh, you can, re oh, you yeah. can really uh, very... acquire a market share. Yeah, but uh, I mean, but they were, you know, they didn't have a monopoly, actually, at the mm -hmm. time. I mean, there were hundreds of brewers, sure, yeah, yeah. hundreds of brewers. And uh, they weren't the only ones brewing stout. But what okay. they were very good at uh, was, uh, I suppose, two things. They were very good at minding the business, and they were very good at what they did. And yeah. they were very good at uh, what we would now call PR, okay. which didn't exist in those yeah. days, but they were very good at it. Yeah. Just looking at today's drug trade, uh, was it just shall we say, organic marketing, or was there a bit of arm twisting going on, you know, you used to... Oh, I think there was a fair bit of arm twisting going on. <clears throat> I mean, there, there are accounts in the early 1800s of uh, rivalries getting out of hand, and, uh, and uh, yeah. more nastily, of uh, sectarian yeah. um, disputes in Dublin where, you know, Guinness, uh, Guinness yeah. barrels were smashed on their way down to the uh, uh, Grand Canal and uh, that kind of thing. Not unlike Prohibition. Not unlike prohibition mm. in one sense, but uh, this was not an official prohibition. This was uh, mm. inter-brewer rivalry, our um, yeah. inter-dealer, yeah, as we, as we say. Well, if you yeah. want to put it that way, yeah. 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 Moving along, somebody who's uh, another colourful character and uh, you know probably no stranger to uh, controversy, Mister Hohe. You called him the boss. Um, I'm interested. What did you? What conclusions did you come to after uh, writing that uh, biography, Joe? Well, he was a very interesting character, and he was a fascinating character. And uh, I think 
the short conclusion was that it was a, an awful pity that he uh, used his talents, which were very considerable, um, mainly to enrich himself rather than to look after the day job. Yep. Yeah, yeah, now, uh, I have uh, mixed feelings here because Mr. Hohey and I went to the same school and uh, the rule says that you don't, uh, you don't talk ill of... Um, uh, fellow schoolmate or fellow uh, alumni or whatever in uh, you know in public anyway whatever we okay. say in private. However, there's one that's uh, an interesting one doing the rounds out in the north side and um, wonder did any of your uh, shall we say your research uh, unearth this that um, he may have had children outside the marriage that we don't know about. Uh, no, I have never come across. You've that. never come across that. No, no. no have not. No. <laughs> so what, as I say, yeah. What they used to say to us in uh, in Joey's Town in Fairview down the road is, is that uh, Charlie Hawhey had the best understanding of quadratic equations than anybody who ever went through there. Now, <laughs> well, that's a bit like uh, uh, they used to say, you know, De Valera was the only man who understood, who, who Einstein. understood Einstein's theory. Yeah. Yes, I mean, does it go with being leader of Fianna Fáil? You know? Oh, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think it must be. No, it's a, it, it's a very, very interesting one because uh, I'm not as critical as uh, Hawhey for the simple reason is that... Um, my understanding, again, talking about that glass ceiling, is that uh, uh, instead of trying to uh, break that glass ceiling, uh, basically Charlie bought the building next door and said, uh, that's what we're doing, this is uh, uh, and, and that's pretty much, we're going to write our rules, and when we're in, that's going to be in for, uh, that's going to be in play, and then, of course, when the blue shirts get in, they'll have their turn, but that's, that's the way I interpreted what he did, uh, and um, that seems to be the ethos of uh, Fianna Fáil on the north side. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm no expert on Fianna Fáil on the yeah. north side, as you are yourself, Paul, clearly. <laughs> yeah, but Joe, when I was uh, when it was announced about uh, a week or so ago, or maybe, you know, within the last two weeks, I was talking to uh, our friends from uh, Dublin City Library, and I was interested because this is probably the first, uh, uh, in fact, I'm almost certain it's the, uh, the first one city, uh, one book that's been written within about, uh, that's been designated within about two or three years of its publication. It's virtually a new book by the standards of the, uh, the previous ones. Um, were you surprised when they picked it? Uh, well, I was surprised but uh, and, and, and obviously delighted, but I don't think you're quite right about that because the uh, last year's one uh, was a book uh, called uh, Fallen by Leah Mills, which yes, was okay. published about three years ago. Yeah, there, there was um, a first published yeah. by okay. uh, yeah. three years ago as well. Yeah, but that was an unusual one because it um, they were doing pretty much Two cities, one book. Something. Yes, and it, and it was very, and yeah. it was linked to nineteen sixteen and, yeah. and and uh, all the commemoration and yeah. all of that. Yeah. Yeah. One of the uh, the smart. Sorry, when I said last year's, of course, I meant this year's. But yes, uh, exactly. Know, yeah, because you're not yeah. you, technically you're not one city, <laughs> one book until the first of January. But it was interesting. Uh, I think it was in the Sunday Times. I saw this. Somebody when they were saying, "Oh, they've announced uh, Echo Land by Joe Joyce," and they said, "Well, you know, where's waking the feminists? Because we've heard they know women." And then somebody had to point out that last year's was actually, or this year's was written by a woman. So, uh, um, uh, but looking at this, John, what I want to uh, uh, talk to you about is is that when you went from journalism to, uh, as we say, you went from being a, a, a journalist to uh, an author. Um, and as I had been told, an author is somebody not who writes books, who gets them published. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, you're, you're, I actually you're, haven't heard that definition yes, before. But, and, um, but were you always, uh, shall we say, an author in waiting? Uh, well, in my own head, I probably was yeah. always an author, yes, yeah. uh, but never managing to get around to it. Um, journalism is uh, is a fascinating business, but it's also not prob probably not the best training for writing books because mm -hmm. journalism is, especially daily journalism, is uh, instant gratification. Mm -hmm. you do it now, write it now. It's um, on the net now, it's in the paper in the morning, yeah. go home, forget all about it, become an expert in something else tomorrow, do it all mm -hmm. over again. Yeah. And um, so you're always working at speed and uh, it's, as I say, instant gratification and writing books is neither. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I, would, I would perhaps argue that uh, particularly what we've seen over the last 20, 25 years is that uh, journalism has really become little more than glorified commentary. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, personally, I think that's one of w one of the unfortunate things that has happened uh, yeah. with journalism. Uh, now it is uh, instant comment on everything, yeah. and very often, as I mean, one of the lessons I learned in journalism, 
you if something happens you always go out and see it because you will always learn something different mm -hmm. and very often what you assume has happened is not actually not exactly what has happened mm -hmm. but nowadays we tend to uh, comment first and find out afterwards yeah is it uh, I don't know how you feel about this because um, when I uh, I spent years in IT and banking and all of that and then when we all got laid off in the early uh, uh, the late 80s early 90s I decided I would do freelance journalism and of course because it's sexy I thought I'll do I'll be a freelance crime reporter very, very quickly I realised that if you do not have police sources, then you really have no future in this... Uh, not uh, in that area. No, not absolutely area. not. I mean, how else, you know, the criminals going to talk to you? You know, are they going to tell you what they're going to do tomorrow, you know? Yeah, well, Veronica Guerin seemed to think that uh, they were telling uh, her the truth. Uh, she did, she yeah. did. She managed to do that, which a uh, few and some other people have done it uh, as, as well, and in her case with... Uh, appalling consequences yeah I would have said basically well because I that I was around that time she started writing all that stuff with a certain uh, person with a pseudonym and I mm. thought you're being played here you are seriously being played by uh, by a villain uh, well journalists are always being played you know yeah. I mean it's uh, it's 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 one of the problems of journalism you are as good as your sources in yeah. one sense but your sources are yeah. Not always, but they all very often have an axe to grind and so on, and you have to be very careful uh, to try as far as you can, which is very often not very far, mm -hmm. uh, to stand up what they are saying by other means. Yeah. It's quite interesting because when you, uh, uh, in the book Echo Land, uh, you talk about essentially uh, media that's not there anymore, but yet was very, very significant in its day. Like, okay, Independent are there, but the Independent that's under Dennis O'Brien is quite different from the Independent that was there, say, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, the Evening Press was a complete, uh, the, well, the, uh, the, the, the Irish Press and the Evening Press was basically the De Valera family, uh, 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 family newsletter to a, a certain degree. Is journalism better now because of uh, what the corporate uh, world we've got? Or? Uh, I think it's a lot tougher. I think journalists themselves are probably a lot better, but I think the job is a lot harder because um, I can't remember the exact figures, but I saw a figure uh, not that long ago for the number of PR people and spin doctors there are in the United States compared to the number of journalists, yeah. and it's like a factor of 20 to 1 or 100 to 1 or yeah. 200 yeah. to 1. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what seems to have happened uh, a lot now is that the uh, spin doctors uh, basically treat the media as a playing field and uh, it is difficult for journalists to break through that a lot of the time. Yeah. I want to get to the book itself, uh, Joe, now. Um, I, uh, I must admit, I love research. I don't know when to stop research. You know, that's uh, you know. Once I get, you know, when when I get a uh, a grain of a story, I uh, I just love following it through. I love following the threads. Uh, I suspect you like that yourself. Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It can become quite an addiction to follow things through. Yeah. And actually, one of the reasons why I've uh, settled on writing historical fiction yeah. has has to do with that actually, because. Um, uh, if you're writing, uh, uh, like I spent a long time writing the book about the Guinnesses, which involved mm. an awful, awful lot there of research, been enormous, research enormous amount mm. of research, and at times in research you inevitably come up against a blank wall. Yeah, and you can't go any further. Frequently, I would imagine. Frequently, yeah, yeah. yeah frequently. Yeah. You know, you're going along fine, and then suddenly the file ends, and there's a missing document, and yeah. ah, you yeah. know, what yeah. do you do? But the great thing about historical fiction is you can dip in and out of the research, mm -hmm. do as much as you like. When you hit the blank wall, you may make it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll create, yeah. Create. Well, no, it's an yes. interesting one, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll ignore the, uh, the the notion that uh, is, is historical fiction an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> I, I like military intelligence, yeah. Yes, but no. Uh, I studied Irish, well, I studied history up to the, the junior cert or whatever you want to call it, and I pretty much gave it away at that stage because I came to the conclusion that there is no Irish history, uh, particularly since, uh, like, you can go back and so say, what we have is an Irish mythology. In other words, we like to weave it. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, I think uh, that's probably putting it a little strongly, but I, th yeah. I think there is a very large element of truth in that. Yeah. That uh, every uh, every history is a nicely rounded narrative that uh, has been rounded very nicely by 
different people at different times for different yeah. reasons and, yeah. and so on. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually working on a, a project at the moment about the 17th, set in the 17th century and uh, period 1691 when there, there are a lot of books written about the battles, uh, okay. the Battle of Ockram, Siege of Limerick in 1691. But when uh, you're looking at writing historical fiction about it and you read all these books, you come to realise the enormous gaps there are uh, in why things, mm -hmm. really why did this guy do this at mm -hmm. this time, you know? Yep, yep. What I love, when I saw the uh, announcement on this, Joe, I've got to admit, I love the title. I thought that's a great title for a book, Echo Land. Uh, the, now, you've written a trilogy which is Echo Land, Echo Beat, Echo Wave. What's the uh, significance of the term echo to you? Uh, why did you uh, well, choose that for the title? Why, why, why uh, I, I, was, I was looking for, for, for something that, that, that suggested um, sounds of foreign wars, but, okay. you know, not but not here. It's kind of mm -hmm. the idea of distant drums, um, mm -hmm. and played around with. Um, I'm, I'm very bad on titles, actually. Oh, no, this and, is a good uh, one. This, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's one word. It's fabulous, okay. and it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It does doesn't it? necessarily mean but anything. But it means no. everything at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So that was the kind of idea uh, behind it. That uh, this was a land. Uh, you know, I Ireland was cut off. But there was all this uh, stuff going on in not that far away mm -hmm. at all, uh, and indeed that it came here once or twice mm -hmm. uh, with um, tra uh, tragic uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the kind of idea behind it. Yeah, yeah. Without uh, spoiling the read for people, roughly speaking, this is a story that is set in Ireland in and set in Dublin, effectively in. 1940, after the evacuation of Dunkirk and the fall of France and the potential uh, invasion of Ireland by either the British or by uh, more likely by the Germans, is that roughly speaking a decent summation of it? Uh, yeah, that's 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 yeah. the setting, and uh, the central character is a young uh, army officer in his yeah. early twenties who from has the country. Been from the country. Any autobiographical details? Uh, some <laughs> autobiographical details, although I wasn't around in 1940, obviously. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so he's, he, he's moved suddenly from uh, yeah. an infantry regiment in, in, mm -hmm. in Galway into yeah. uh, uh, the headquarters of uh, G2, which is the military yeah, intelligence. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he's suddenly thrown from the country into Dublin, mm -hmm. into this other world, and uh, yeah. I see him very much. I mean, he's not your typical as a uh, some people have pointed out in reviews, he is not your typical spy, he's not world weary, he's very young, yeah. it's all new to him, but I, I, in a way, tried to avoid that cliché, yeah. but also in another way, realised that he was a good um, vehicle for our eyes and ears into that whole period because it is new to him and all the, the politics, the spying and so on is totally new to him. Yeah. I'm interested, again, just to uh, return to your research there, one of the people uh, that seemed to me to be quite significant in that period, and it comes through in a, in a couple of other books I've read, was a, uh, um, a gentleman called Dan Bryant. I think he was a major and I think he headed up G2. Did you uh, manage to get into Dan's archives or uh, did you manage I've, to... I've, I've read some of his uh, yeah. stuff, yeah. yeah. I don't think he's uh, written an awful lot of stuff, but there is a lot written about him. Yeah. Uh, he was um, ended up Colonel, Colonel Dan Bryant yeah. uh, as head of G2, yeah. Yes. yeah. He, it, it struck me that um, he seemed to be quite aware of shall we say, the duplicitous, the duplicitous nature of what Nazi uh, views for Ireland and, uh, and have quite a realistic, uh, um, shall we say, analysis of what the consequences were if that came out. That's something I wanted to ask you about. Um, essentially, what we seem to have here is is that we have, uh, and I don't want to spoil the story, is we have on the one hand, we have the government, which de Valera was in power at the time. We also have, shall we say, the... IRA, which was hanging around at the time. Now, current Sinn Féin will say that, oh, you know, we were basically, we were always nationalists, blah, 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 and, you know, whatever uh, issues we had, we really weren't uh, buying into any of that Nazi stuff and so on and so forth. How uh, accurate do you think that is? Do you think that's a bit self-serving, that uh, conclusion? Oh, of course it's a bit self-serving. I mean, we were we were neutral, and they yeah. were not neutral. Yeah. They were in favour of one side. Now, yeah. uh, you know, in, in in the traditional sense that uh, 
you know, England's difficulty was Ireland's opportunity. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they were they were trying to uh, they were helping uh, the Germans, and uh, they possibly didn't care very much about uh, what was going on yeah. in Germany. Yeah. Uh, and to be fair, you know, not a lot of people knew a lot about what was going on in Germany uh, yeah. until quite a late stage in the war. I might take that one up off the air with you, but a separate, a separate matter then, if that was the case. Um, you, the Uncle Timmy, who you talk about, who was a Fianna Fáil politician, there seemed to be a view that, uh, well, if the Germans came in, it might be that bad because... Uh, Although it would be the big Reich and all of that, but we'd be this independent uh, nation, a bit like Brexit in that sense of the word. Um, uh, was that view widespread? I don't think it was terribly widespread, but it, 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 was, it was a view that uh, certainly existed. And uh, there were people in the government who uh, felt that way uh, to an extent that uh, it wouldn't have been a total disaster. Yeah. And uh, indeed, there were, there, there were quite a few influential people of one kind or another uh, the Catholic Archbishop of Armagh at yeah. one stage said that it would be better if the Germans won yeah. because uh, it would put an end to the anti to the materialism of the Anglo-Saxon world influence on us yeah. and he dismissed Nazism as a passing fad. Yeah. Okay, uh, just in conclusion, Joe, we're unfortunately going to run out of time. I'd love to talk to you for the rest of the day about this. The church didn't seem to feature very much in the book, even though I know from my research that the church was actually playing quite a shadowy role. Uh, I no, it doesn't. They weren't a neutral doesn't... observer. Put it that way. Well, uh, well, some of them were. I mean, they were they, yeah. they were divided uh, along with any everybody else. I mean, well, one of the main uh, campaigners here uh, yeah. about uh, anti-Nazi campaigners, uh, indeed, was a priest. Okay. Sadly, we have run out of time. We can't uh, spend any more time talking to the author of Echo Land, Joe Joyce. It's been a delight to talk to you, Joe. Uh, and I would hope that everybody will go out there and buy Echo Land, published by Liberties Press. Um, it's a fabulous book, a fabulous read, and it's an insight into a, uh, a not very well-known piece of Irish history. I want to thank Kira for doing such a terrific job on the desk. I'm Mick Fitz, and I'll be back in two weeks' time. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Mick. Yeah.